Hello, and welcome to this series on demand and community engagement, which is part of the 2023 Gavin Funding and Process Briefing Series. I'm Tom Davis, Senior Manager for Demand and Community Engagement. The objectives of this capacity building session are to help you to understand Gavi's program funding guidance on demand and community engagement, to explain the practical demand and community engagement points to bear in mind while developing FPP and EAF applications, and also to help you align your applications with our guidance in terms of encouraged and discouraged demand and community engagement activities. Let's start with some lessons learned. A review of 25 HSS grant applications between 2019 and 2021 found several areas where FFP and EAF proposals to Gavi were weak in terms of demand and community engagement. One problem was that there's very little investment in collecting and using social and behavioral data to plan demand and community engagement interventions. This often quantitative data is a foundation upon which decisions should be made about demand and community engagement. There are a host of reasons that people don't seek immunization for their children or their own immunization for COVID-19, for example. So we need to identify and understand those barriers and enablers as a first step. Secondly, there has often been a lack of documentation or evaluation to understand the impact of some of the proposed activities in this area. That is, the interventions proposed are often not evidence-based. You may think that a lot of what you need to do to influence vaccination demand is simply intuitive, but it's not. Lots of things don't work and lots of things do work and context is very important. Third, digital and online communication is increasingly important in many contexts, but many EPI programs have simply lacked capacity or expertise in this area. UNICEF and WHO have been working to help build this capacity using GAVI SFA funding. Fourth, there's still a lack of evidence-based guidance on behavioral interventions, including service experience interventions. Service experience refers to what the caregiver or person experiences when they come for vaccinations. Are they treated well and respected? Is time they spend waiting reasonable and have they been made comfortable? We have interventions for changing that experience. There's a lot of evidence out there on behavioral interventions and development, but less on what specifically works in each type of vaccination setting, for example, with nomadic groups, with IDPs, island communities, and urban areas. And in FPPs, the response to service experience issues is often limited to plans for IPC training and don't mention evidence-based curricula for actually changing service providers' uh, practices in this area. Fifth, there have been substantial investments in mass media and printed materials which have limited effectiveness, especially when used as a main intervention for behavior change rather than as a supportive activity. So why do we need demand generation and community engagement anyway? Well, demand generation aims to ensure that parents, caregivers, communities, and other key in-country stakeholders value immunization, that they trust the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, that they have confidence in the quality and reliability of the services and the authorities providing them, and that they face few other barriers perceived and otherwise to immunization. They also need to have the necessary information, capacity, and motivation to access immunization and complete the vaccination schedule in a timely manner. And demand generation contributes towards improving coverage and equity. This diagram shows our demand action framework and shows some of the shifts we're trying to make in terms of demand. The first is to do planning based on data on behavioral and social drivers for vaccination. This means doing surveys and some quantitative analysis to see which of those drivers are more important in a given setting and sometimes qualitative methods to surface other things that might not be captured in the current survey. The second is to design interventions that address those behavioral and social drivers and challenges along the caregiver journey. The third area of shifts regards implementation. We want to see more behaviorally informed interventions being used with health workers, including community health workers and volunteers. For example, training them to use better interpersonal communication and counseling. We want to see interventions to improve the way in which service providers do promotion of vaccines and vaccination. We also want to see demand and community engagement activities targeted 
at caregivers, including interventions based on the latest behavioral science, digital engagement like SMS reminder messages and interactions via social media, and improve risk communication and community engagement. The Gabby Alliance partners have done a lot of work over the years to build this framework of behavioral and social drivers, looking at the published literature to see what those factors are that often affect vaccination demand. The most powerful ones are often in the social processes category. For example, perceived social norms and family norms. That is someone's perception, both of what one's friends, family members, and leaders want them to do, called injunctive social norms, and what most other people are already doing called descriptive social norms. If you think that most of your friends, family members, and religious leaders want you to vaccinate your child, and that most of them will vaccinate their own children, you are, most, uh, you are much more likely to vaccinate your own children. Health worker recommendations also fit in this category, and gender equity. We measure which women feel that they have permission to take their child to the clinic, for example. But there are many other drivers, perceived as disease risk. If you don't think that your child is at risk of getting a particular vaccine preventable disease or that that vaccine preventable disease is serious, you may not seek out vaccination against it. Vaccine confidence. If you don't think that a vaccine is safe or that it will work, you may not seek vaccination. Availability and affordability. If you don't think that you can easily access vaccines because the post is far away, because it costs too much money for transport, because there are people that treat you poorly there, you may not seek vaccination. Sometimes people think that it's all about motivation and that people who don't vaccinate their children are simply, quote, not motivated, unquote. But let's remember that the intention to vaccinate a child is influenced by a host of other things, which I've already mentioned here. The good thing is that we, had, we have a great tool that helps us look at all of these potential drivers and determinants called the BESD, or BEST, survey. If I had one thing to recommend in terms of improving vaccination demand globally, it would be to use this survey tool at the subnational level and then to base high coverage interventions on the findings of it. The five indicators on the right were chosen as a priority ones based on the literature, and these are the questions related to those, which I won't go through now, that help sort out which are most important. Okay. So look, let's look at our recommended objectives and activities for demand generation and community engagement. These are based on the program funding guidance. First, here are five demand generation objectives. Number one, design and implement social and behavioral change interventions. These should be community-based and facility-based interventions that build trust, confidence, and active demand for immunization in primary health care ensuring a strong gender lens to address social and gender-related barriers to uptake. Second, support the scale-up of behavioral and social driver data and information systems, including but not limited to social listening. These are used to help do that, number one, of designing and implement social behavior change interventions. Third, improve capacity in designing, implementing, monitoring, and or evaluating demand-generating activities at all levels. Fourth is increase advocacy for social and political commitments and increase accountability for equitable immunization at all levels. And fifth is to strengthen partnerships with local and community actors to improve demand for immunization. These are the things we want to see in applications. So regarding that first objective, here are some illustrated, illustrative encouraged activities. First, Use community and health worker insights and feedback to improve service quality and client experience. They're the ears in the community that can really help you know what's going on and what needs to be changed at times, in addition to the behavioral and social driver data. Second, intensify community engagement by community health workers, mobilizers, and influencers in areas with a high number of missed communities and zero dose and under immunized children. This interpersonal communication by these folks is one of the main ways that we actually build demand. Third, engage trusted influencers, including traditional and faith leaders, community health workers and mobilizers, to address vaccine hesitancy and low trust in areas where this has been identified as a barrier to vaccine uptake. We need to have these influencers on our side in terms of being champions of vaccination. Also, you can work with CSOs, CBOs, and FBOs and private health providers to generate demand and address hesitancy 
and hard to reach areas and missed communities. So think, don't just think about government health workers. Remember, we have all these other groups that are our uh, disposal that we can engage to help out with this. And also implement gender transformative interventions to address negative gender norms in health systems and actively work to change them. This might include something like helping women to have more agency in terms of seeking out immunization. And that involves working with both men and women. This list talks about some illustrative discouraged activities in this regard. What we want to avoid are generic demand-related activities that are not aligned with the identified behavioral and social drivers of uptake and demand. For example, doing a social norms-focused intervention where affordability is the problem. We need to have a, a linkage between what the problem is and what the solution is that's being proposed. Also, we want to avoid undifferentiated cost-intensive development and deployment of mass media, things like TV, radio, social media, and traditional media like printed newspapers and magazines without appropriate audience targeting. This is fine to use if you have good targeting where you understand who the audience is, what some of their uh, uh, the problems are in terms of demand, and you're targeting that messaging. But it shouldn't just be about benefits of vaccination and uh, things like that. Also, <clears throat> we want to avoid recurrent investment in branding and mobilization products like t-shirts, megaphones, leaflets, and posters, use of written materials when engaging low literacy beneficiaries, or digital and social listening for populations where hardly anyone has uh, social media or uses it, and interventions which reinforce negative and harmful gender norms. Let's talk about objective two now, supporting the scale up of behavioral and social drivers data and information systems. So some of the things we encourage is to increase the collection, availability, analysis, and use of that best data. This is often through a survey, preferably at the subnational level and with key zero-dose groups like pastoralists and IDPs. Don't assume that every group you're trying to reach has the same drivers and determinants of vaccination. It can be very different. Also establish and use effective social listening and online and offline rumor monitoring systems. This has been very helpful in uh, during COVID-19 and something we're increasingly applying with routine immunization where people are highly engaged uh, uh, in social media. We're also, we have some illustrative uh, discouraged activities like time and resource intensive qualitative and quantitative data collection and studies that are not linked to intervention planning or design like non-best knowledge aptitude and practice surveys CAP surveys are fine if they're measuring those five main determinants, those five main issues, and, and beyond that, that's okay. But if it's just collecting data on things that aren't known to be that well linked with immunization, we want to discourage that. And social listening systems without a systematic plan for use of the data, we don't need that either. Let's talk about objective three, improving the capacity and designing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating demand generation activities at all levels. Some of the things we encourage in this area are like building capacity for collecting and analyzing best data, as we mentioned, building cat capacity for evidence-based design and implementation of social behavior change interventions with healthcare workers and with caregivers. And remember, you need to think about reach. Uh, doing it with just a small segment of the population often isn't gonna do very much. Conducting capacity assessment and building a frontline worker's ability to adapt demand generation activities and messages to local contexts and then to implement them, and increasing national and subnational capacity for risk and crisis communications, effective and timely responses to adverse events following immunization, and vaccine-related events and vaccine hesitancy. And in general, we encourage using multiple channels. If you're if someone is hearing information about vaccination, not just from radio, but from radio, their healthcare worker, and maybe SMS, those multiple channels help to convince them more than a single channel usually. We're discouraging activities like large scale uh, classroom or cascade training without any sort of strategic approach and associated monitoring plan, something that seems more on building people's knowledge rather than actually getting them to change what they're doing. And also we discourage large scale design and production of print materials that aren't really linked to the behavioral science or human centered design process. Objective four is to increase advocacy for social and political commitments and increase accountability for equitable immunization at all levels. So for this, 
We encourage activities such as developing evidence-based advocacy approaches, materials, and campaigns, organizing and are engaging in key advocacy events in the country, partnering with community-based champions, CSOs, CBOs, FBOs, to develop and disseminate those advocacy messages and to systematically engage with key ministries and parliamentarians to build that political will for equitable immunization. Things that we discourage in this area are like production of an advocacy material which don't draw on evidence or take the target audience into account, kind of developed in a vacuum, or advocacy campaigns that are not accompanied by a clear monitoring and evaluation plan. Partnership is also key. Objective five is to strengthen partnerships with local and community actors to improve demand. For example, we encourage collaborating with CSOs, CBOs, and faith-based organizations to track and address rumors, misinformation, and mistrust relating to immunization. You can also partner with them to design and implement tailored demand interventions to address underlying barriers to vaccine uptake in missed communities. And you can map CSOs, CBOs, and faith-based organizations and key local uh, actors, especially in areas with high numbers of zero-dose children for demand generation, and then contract with them to be able to do demand activities there. What we, it, we discourage in this area is any sort of ad hoc engagement with local community actors without an engagement plan uh, covering expected results, a timeline, and follow-up or generic community-based interventions which are not aligned with the country's broader community health strategy. We don't want to see someone saying, we're going to reach all the community leaders and faith-based leaders and all the communities throughout the entire country. You really need some targeting there, and we need to specify what are you trying to uh, keep as your key messages and activities when we work with these groups. A few other demand and community engagement interventions to consider that aren't mentioned at this point in our program funding guidance is use of two-tiered community health worker systems like the care group approach and the Women's Development Army. I have a link there on some of the articles on that. Uh, in a uh, great literature uh, review we did, we saw about 11 point uh, better uh, reach of with DTP1 and communities that were reached with the care group approach versus other community health worker systems. Uh, so we're excited about that. We'll be testing it with our SFAs. Use of integrated service delivery, especially things like immunization nutrition integration. This is a great way to especially reach zero dose communities where maybe there are hardly any services being offered by the government. So offering more than one at once and pairing it with something that people highly value can bring in more children for immunization. Use of demand side incentives. This is something that's being tested with our um, uh, uh, finance and sustainability SFA. Uh, where you're actually offering some sort of non-financial incentive or uh, a, a financial one to basically attract more people to get vaccines. And use of social accountability models. That will also be tested along with that care group approach where we're teaching people about their rights, how they should be treated, and then having them engage with service providers to try to advocate for better service delivery. So in summary, here are some of the key takeaways for programming for demand and community engagement. Some of the things we want to see is using the program funding guidelines when developing applications. This is our North Star. Ensuring that SBC and demand experts are at the table when you're developing these. Remembering that demand interventions must be closely linked with service delivery. So don't expect demand to solve a delivery problem. And for EAFs in particular, zero dose analytical questions on demand are critical. We need to contextualize what we're doing and include activities on measuring the impact of demand interventions and investments and applications. And SFA funding might be able to help with that. In terms of what not to do, usually the demand experts are brought in at a later stage, and that's a miss out. We need to avoid this. And RC uses the program funding guidance to review country proposals. So activities that don't align with that simply might not be approved. So you should try to stick to the ones that we're recommending. I won't go through all of these, but here's some technical research, uh, resources you might want to use. Uh, this paper on behavioral and social drivers of vaccination uh, can be very helpful, and it has the, uh, the survey questionnaire as well. Human-centered design for health. This is something that UNICEF is really helping us to scale. I've got a link there. Finding the signal through the noise is a landscape review and framework on improving the effective use of digital social listening. 
uh, for immunization demand generation. And lastly, our link to the vaccination demand hub and knowledge base. Uh, Gabby and I uh, co-chair that vaccination demand hub, has some excellent resources that you can use. And if demand and behavior change is something that really interests you, uh, here's my list in terms of human behavior and behavior change books uh, that I find to be very fascinating and you might as well. So check some of those out. Thank you very much.